Hello and welcome. Uh, as Ali said, my name's Alastair Burtonshaw, Bryce Director and Chief Executive of Watts Gallery Artists Village, which sits just a stone's throw from here, deep in the Surrey Hills area of outstanding natural beauty at Compton, just outside Guildford. And I have the privilege of also being Chair of Surrey Hills Arts. Thank you for joining us at this crucial time when we are increasingly seeing the devastating effects from the rising climate and the loss of species globally. Surrey has one of the fastest declining wildlife populations of any county in England. Indeed, the Surrey Wildlife Trust's State of Surrey's Nature report showed that a third of our species are now either extinct or at risk of extinction. So now is the time for all of us to act and to rethink how we live and how we work. I firmly believe that artists can pose vital questions and help us to navigate these challenging times. In coming together today, we can explore different ways in which artists are approaching these dilemmas and share new ideas collectively together. Since 2015, Surrey Hills Arts has focused on connecting people to nature and our beautiful landscape. Through a deeper connection comes a deeper respect and care for nature. We are now taking this further to support our declining species in a project called Habitat. We're delighted to have just been awarded Arts Council England funding to run a pilot scheme right here on campus at the University of Surrey to green built areas and introduce sculptural habitats working with the University and Surrey Wildlife Trust and engaging the surrounding community to learn about their local species and how to support them. To get the most out of today, I encourage you, as Ali has done, to all ask questions at the end of each presentation or offer ideas to make it an open, informal and useful debate. But, that, but without further ado, I'm really pleased to introduce our first speakers, international environmental artists, also based in Surrey, at Croydon Harvey. Over to you. Thank you so much, Ali. Thank you, Alex. So we have 20 minutes, and we're going to concentrate really on our work over the last three years, because this is work that is propelling us more and more into an activist stage of art making. By desire, by necessity, by sheer, what else do we begin to do? Of course, there are many things we can do, but we're just going to show you how we've been approaching our work over the last three years. So, we've Dan been, is on Facebook. <laughs> no, we've been working together for 30 years, and, I mean, there's no way in the 20 minutes that we have that we can begin to delve into the whole history of that. So, it's a, a very sort of... I, I don't know, it's, it's an overview of some of the recent stuff that we've been involved with since uh, organisations such as Extinction Rebellion took off. So, yeah, Dan said to me last October... Well three years ago in October, that he's on Facebook. I don't do Facebook, but he said, OK, Extinction Rebellion are going to be meeting in Parliament Square, October the 31st. And we said, well, let's go. We read a bit about it, and we just thought, we need this. We need another kind of surge of activity here. And there we were, Parliament Square, with a few hundred other people. Greta Thunberg was there speaking. I and remember this was... thinking, who's this young child? <laughs> what, what, what's so important about her? I hadn't heard of her before. And what was lovely, there's something they call mic check. It's actually illegal to have amplification in Parliament Square. They had a small amplifier, but not everyone could hear her. So there was this moment where she would say a phrase, and everyone who could hear it would then repeat it. So it was like this sort of call and answer going out. It was very, very special. It was very moving. And this was the first time that we witnessed people laying down in the road, obstructing and being arrested. It is so, so important, and actually at the heart of Extinction Rebellion, 
that it is peaceful, non-violent direct action. But we and thousands of others have arrived at this point after years, in some cases decades, when you look at octogenarians locking themselves on to uh, the Houses of Parliament or to Buckingham Palace or wherever else, have tried every which way but loose. So we also are presented with oil extraction right in Surrey. And many of you here will be aware of the campaign, Leith Hill, No Drill. It started off with people living in the community, particularly up in uh, Leith Hill, Leith Hill Action Group. Hundreds of thousands of pounds were spent in high court appeals to stop it happening. In 2016, what we called the infantry, T-R-E-E, arrived. A delightful, anarchic, motley, charismatic group of people who started to make tree houses, dig, in the, uh, dig, dig, dig tunnels, but they never ever lit a fire. So the, every day people were bringing food. The, the bylaws on Leith Hill were such that they would be breaking them if in, during the really cold part of winter, if they had any sign of a fire, they would have been evicted from that site. So they passed the first winter there, heating with candles with flower pots over them and passive house sort of straw bale buildings and things. Amazing, courageous people. And it was, I think if it hadn't been for people like that, the legal side of it, and then the support from local people, we wouldn't have won. And there was a win there. They are not going to drill on Leaf Hill. Ten years, though. This is how long it can take, and longer, and longer. And nothing is ever set in stone. So these wins need to be celebrated, but at the same time, we always just have to be very, very watchful. At the moment, there's a full-on campaign. At the moment, they want to expand Horse Hill, which is between Dorking and Gatwick, four times. And so there's just been recently a High Court um, appeal yeah. by Sarah Finch. So please do look into that. We're going this to move... This picture Sorry. is actually from Preston New Road. We've had uh, up, up in the north one of the first fracking sites. But we were up there supporting them because they've been down here supporting us on, at Horse Hill. So we were part of... Uh, following Parliament Square, we were then involved with the... With the, with the bridges locked down so quickly, we see, we almost had a ready-made XR group because we had been campaigning and working against Leith Hill, so it's like a sidestep for us to be involved in Extinction Rebellion. It's robust. It's actually Rygate, uh, Dorking and Rygate Extinction Rebellion. It's robust. There are many, many people in it, people you would never, ever suspect to be rebels or to be activists. You know, we have a retired senior um, meteorologist who actually we was working on editing IPCC reports. By nature, gentle, by nature, a man of faith. He's not a natural rebel, but he knows what is happening. And he said, I'm doing this. I have to do this for, you know, people now and of the future. And some images from Leith Hill. We, so, yeah. Also with so. Extinction Rebellion, uh, there are conversations around fast fashion and the whole of that industry. So... We grew grass coats for uh, the London Fashion Week. Uh, this is with a friend of ours who's also a very strong rebel. She actually drove the bus up to Preston New Road with a, a group of us. She's an incredible lady, Pam, but she is a model. She's often seen in The Guardian. But the grass coats we actually first grew when Heather and I first worked together nearly 30 years ago as part of the Lynx anti-fur campaign. And we, we had pictures of them outside the fur shop at the Ritz and things. But, of course, that was pre-social media. So very few people actually saw them, apart from one or two clips from the, the Lynx campaign. So there was impact, which is what we were going for. You know, we had, we had a clear target to some extent. And there was a flurry of media interest. So, you know, again, gesture, potentially gesture statements. It remains to be seen between the statement or the pledge and really what happens, the same as with COP26 or any of the COPs that have been happening. Um, but it was, making, um, it was making Vogue, it was making the Financial Times, it was making the Observer. Um, so again, a lot of interest, but of course now we've got social media, and we've got the traffic for social media, and we are, you know, we're sort of like an ecology of, you know, um, of, of dissenting or uh, campaigning movements. So it can quickly be spread out through many different uh, lateral organisations. Um, so there has been an impact, but we can't now just go, OK, we have to still 
bring forth more and to do, and to do more. Uh, Mary McCartney is actually very... Inv- uh, sorry, it's not Mary McCartney, it's her sister, who's the designer, is very involved in this as well. Um, Stella is very, very involved in this. So I think, you know, we may be looking for a conversation there later down the line. So where I think are we now? One of the things that drew us to Extinction Rebellion, apart from the, the wonderful graphics, the choice of colours, and it's really there was quite a shift in it as a as a protest movement. Uh, and I think, I because mean, I've often found going on marches and things just doesn't you know it makes you feel good while you're doing it, but then afterwards everyone seems to go home and it stops. But they weren't. They kept on building it up. There were meetings going and things happening. I mean, I'm sure you've all seen the iconic pink boat that was uh, bolted to the ground within a matter of seconds when it stopped on Oxford Street and was there for the best part of 11 days. But the last rebellion... No, this is uh, the rebellion, uh, not this year, but last year. The police were everywhere in Parliament Square, and yet Extinction Rebellion took them by surprise again. So there are already people locked on underneath it at this point. The ingenuity that they have, I think, which I find, find incredible. I'd seen that vehicle pass twice around the square before they actually locked on underneath it, and it stayed there for the whole of the rest of the day. The police couldn't move it. Act now. And this is a call. It's also a call for politicians to absolutely put the gravity of the situation into policy across the board. And Parliament declared... Um, a climate uh, emergency in 2019, but there is so much further to go. The other request, demand, is for citizens' assemblies that, a bit like jury sortition, that we, the common person, has a place in these high-level policy decisions. So we're going to move on to a more recent piece of work, just because of time now. So we're going to show um, a piece of work. Is this Revel? Yeah. Okay. So this is a piece of work um, for the Estuary Festival. So this is I just a short right piece, um, um, kind I'm of an, an overview of the and piece. Together we work under the name Ackroyd and Harvey. We have created a piece of work called Rebel, and Rebel exists as some framed artworks which are displayed in the Dutch barn, a trap on which is mounted what we call a photosynthesis photograph, which is depicting a portrait of a rebel. The photographs are produced by growing grass vertically in a darkened space and projecting a black and white negative onto them. So it's purely the production of chlorophyll, the green pigment, where there's a lot of light, goes very dark green, where there's less light, less green, where there's no light, there's no chlorophyll, it's yellow. We're opening here, Wat Tyler Country Park. Wat Tyler, renowned for leading the peasant revolt in 1381. 60,000 peasants from Essex and Kent moved through all of the network of roads to the city to speak with King Richard II, saying they had rights. It was an extraordinary moment in time, but the rebellion was squashed. Today, we are seeing a whole global movement of people in protest, in rebellion against extinction of nature, extinction of people. So we are working with three performers. They are using text. 
that we have been given permission from Writers Rebel. The third piece of writing is by a wonderful young man who very sadly and unexpectedly died last year. These are the words of wildlife biologist and campaigner Raphael Coleman, known as Iggy Fox. Taken from the defence speech he planned to deliver in court alongside other exile activists. After his death, his mother found a collection of his writings. He opens. Nothing has ever inspired me so powerfully. Nothing has ever given me so much hope or a sense of purpose. Nothing has ever been so clear to me as these visions that I have for the future. And he closes. I will not be dead until my dream is. I will not fade away until my vision does. I will not be gone until my hopes are. Uh, Iggy um, Fox was a remarkable young man, actually was pretty well known as um, a child TV star, film star, but he kind of kept that very, very low. And again, he became an activist. He refused to be what he called a scribe of the apocalypse. Scientists who do the data publish, but actually do not get involved. So he, was, he splattered the Brazilian embassy with red paint. And this, uh, as part of the performance, um, James, the actor, actually delivered the court statement that, that Iggy had prepared, but Tragically, he died before he ever got to that point. His mother, Liz, Liz Jensen, is part of Writers' Rebel, and Writers' Rebel is the literary wing of Extinction Rebellion. And we had an approach. We've been aware of their work. They really are extraordinary. Uh, writers have been involved with them. Uh, Margaret Atwood, worldwide well-known writers. They've done some really powerful uh, activist pieces, um, a, a, a very defiant, willful, but very strong piece at Tufton, at Tufton Street as well, which I would urge you to have a look at. So they approached us um, earlier on in this year when we were already came out of lockdown uh, into what felt like overdrive to see whether or not we would like to discuss with Ben Oakry um, a collaboration. And Ben Oakry is a writer certainly have been very, very aware of for the last three decades. He won the Booker Prize in 1991 for The Famished Road. I hadn't read it. I thought, this is the time. <laughs> this is the time to read this book. And as we were discussing with Ben and with Writers Rebel, there was a group of us, a creative team. You know, reading his book at the same time was just a, a, an entry into another kind of very deep spiritual world. Ben is a very beautiful, very spiritual, but very politicized man. And we created a piece of work called On the Shore. This is in two acts.
So the, the reason it's in two acts is because the Tate Gallery, we actually approached them when they were still shut, asking them if we could grow the piece in there because it was close to the Thames when they were shut uh, and then remove it before they opened. But actually, Francis Morris, the director, said it would be much easier to do it when we're open. So they lent us the turbine hall to grow the piece in, but they couldn't be seen to be part of Extinction Rebellion as, as an organization, although they have declared it a state of climate and ecological emergency. So there had to be a, a clear definition between when it was in the Tate, it was a collaboration between ourselves and Ben Oakry. As soon as it left, it could be whatever we wanted it to be, and it became a rebellious act. We didn't have permission to float it on the Thames, and actually the day before I had the police on the phone to me about it, but they allowed us to go ahead. This earth that we love is in great danger because of us. They say that the earth has, I don't know, maybe only 50 years of topsoil left. They say, I don't know, maybe we've only got two decades of fishes in the sea. Can you hear the future weeping? In the past, we have used fear. We have thrown facts at people. It seems to be asking too much for people to alter how they live so that life on this planet can survive. Fear doesn't work. Guilt doesn't work. So I thought maybe love might work. We are at a terminal point. It's either extinction or we become a newer, more efficient, more loving species. Nothing ordinary can achieve that. Only love can do it. Our love must save the world. For love is the last power that stands between us and extinction. As an economist once said, there is only one true economy on our planet, and that is photosynthesis. And photosynthesis takes light and it converts it to life and it nourishes us all. I'm a huge believer in the power of art. Um, whilst we are here right now, art is such a threat that the Met Police have raided the Extinction Rebellion art factory. At its very essence, for me, art is the soul of humanity. We are Writers' Rebel. Extinction Rebellion's very own literary wing. Our mission is to put literature in the service of humankind's greatest challenge, ensuring the safe continuation of ecological life on this planet in all its astonishing diversity. I think for me, we look at the planet and we, we think of the planet as almost inanimate, as solid and fixed, but it's not, it's all in motion. Whether it's the bacteria in the soil, the worms moving the soil, we are part of nature and we need to learn to love that. This little fragment of a song came from Mirabella. If you want the pure voice, you have it, so just enjoy it. couldn't have been produced if it hadn't been for uh, probably around about a hundred people giving up their time, uh, energy for nothing, some of whom were uh, here in the audience I think who were on the shore with us helping float it. Um, I'm so glad we got away with it, floating something on the Thames isn't easy, the current there is 
unbelievable and, and it moves one way, rises seven metres and then moves the other way. And by the evening we removed it all, there was nothing left. The only problem was the van was inquested by the police earlier that day at the XR art factory, so we didn't have any transport to remove anything. But. We got there in the end. Just before we go into, um, you know, kind of a conversation, um, uh, we, we, we are part of Culture Declares Emergency, declaring a cultural and uh, a climate and ecological emergency. Culture Declares Emergency actually happened before the Extinction Rebellion, Easter Rebellion in 2019. And um, it's a movement now of nearly 2,000 artists and institutions, including Somerset House, Bristol Old Vic, uh, the, the Royal Court, Tate, um, many, many, the British Film uh, Institute, Notables, Cornelia Parker, um, Anthony Gormley, Akram Khan, Dance Company, and every day it's growing. We had 30 new people um, come to um, a, you know, kind of a Zoom get-together, uh, which happens uh, bi-monthly. So we invite you to join Culture Declares Emergency. Um, you it will be, be said yeah. that it's affiliated to Extinction Rebellion, but it's a separate entity because certain organisations and individuals perhaps don't want to be linked uh, to a group that is non-violent civil disobedience. It, it's an ally. We're allies. I mean, we actually have very much our own, our own interests and our own business, for want of a better word. Architects Declare Emergency also came into being in 2019. Music Declares Emergency. So there's this ecology of these, of these, of these emergency movements that really move between the interface of art and architecture, culture, music and design. We're just going to show a very brief piece from the launch in 2019 with a very wonderful and beautiful... Oh, <laughs> no, we're not. What are we going to do? No, I, okay. don't know. I think that's the one just before... Oh, yes. So um, this was a piece that we did in 2015 um, uh, at the COP21 in Paris, and it's called the Tree Ceremony. And this is an evergreen oak, which actually is a tree that will fare very, very well, particularly in sort of more southern European climates, because it keeps its leaves all year round, keeps on photosynthesizing, absorbing carbon, pumping out oxygen, and creates wonderful biodiversity um, for multi-species. Um, so Zena Edwards, uh, we're currently working um, on initial ideas with Zena, and she is um, a very celebrated and acclaimed poet and performer and climate activist who is really, really championing um, black and brown climate activists and saying we need a place at the table. So, yeah, the Extinction Rebellion was launched. Uh, I'm... Culture Declares was launched at Somerset House and we held up traffic on Waterloo Bridge. We went across to the South Bank Centre the, and down to the Tate and finishing up at the Globe Theatre. But it was very much... Uh, I don't think any of us had met, actually, prior to the day before. No, it was the first time. This. Zena was putting the coat on. It was like, hi, I'm Heather. She goes, yeah, I'm Zena. And then she just went in and did this incredible we, performance. We had it, sort of cased the joint at uh, the Tate and found that we could get the horse probably in there. But Frances Morris actually said, were you planning on coming in? And she said, I will invite you in and I will let the guards know. Yeah. So, I am an endangered species.
Um, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, Zena, actually, we only spoke to Zena the day before. We, we knew nothing about her. Uh, and she said, would you like me to come and perform? I mean, some, some of these things happen like that. The, I think the fact that we got away with floating the piece on the Thames was the fact that a friend of ours who we have worked with in the past, an architect, rocked up two days before we were due to do that and says, do you want a, a, a what was it, a, my mind's gone blank, um, a risk assessment. Uh, and he put together this amazing risk assessment that we sent to the police and we sent to the London Port Authorities. And I think they hadn't seen anything quite like it, but it was just the luck of the moment of throwing yourselves into things and then just hoping that they work and, and you know, they can at times. So we could, if, if there's any um, questions or um, debates or... Yeah, and if there's any questions, a, um, you can either shout out or... How long do we have, Ali? Uh, we've got a, about eight minutes, eight minutes to go overall. Yeah. Um, yeah, or I can pass the microphone if you put your hand up. Sorry, I... Were you invited to make the piece? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Were you invited to make the piece at the... At COP. COP. Were we invited to do something yeah. at COP? So what happened was, with Culture Declares Emergency, we put together a bid for, I think it was the, the Green Zone, I think, uh, for a booth for a number of days, working with Music Declares Emergency, Architects, Doctors Declare Emergency. Wow. No, talking about the Paris one. Oh, sorry, Paris. <laughs> that, that was this Oh, year. I beg your but, pardon. But no, the, the Paris one was through Coal, was it? I uh, can't remember now. Yeah, it was through um, an organisation who do a lot of work around, yeah, uh, sustainability in the environment and artists called Coal, C-O-A-L. They also do annual prizes, which is worth looking into, which draws interest from artists all across Europe. Um, so we, just, we made the proposal. There was very, very little budget, but we had excellent support from... It was at the Jardin, um, the, Bot the Botanic Garden, and just in front of their Natural History Museum. And the director sort of uh, helped organise growing space for the grass drapes, um, at, where was it, Chevrolet, which is in Versailles? Yeah, it was the yeah. Arboretum in Versailles. That's so right. we, we had greenhouses because it was December that we installed that piece. So we were very, again, very lucky that we had this wonderful growing space to grow all, all the grass fabric. Yeah. But, yeah. but just, to, just to go back to about but Glasgow, we put, the, put this bid in, um, but actually we, we, did, we didn't get it. And, you know, a couple of Culture Declare... Um, you know, kind of members just said, well, take that, take that as a, you know, as a kind of a, a badge of honour. <laughs> you know, there, reputation goes before you. Crazy things with uh, the COP that's just happened. Bill Dunster, who is a fantastic zero emission architect who has built lots and lots of buildings. He applied for a stall up there and they said that he was too small a group and they gave those stalls to other building firms who have never built a zero emission building in their lives but because they were bigger. I mean, this is a sort of problems we're up against, I think. So. Well, the bigger problem we're up against is, you know, in fact, Extinction, I opened an email this morning from Extinction Rebellion saying, um, you know, 1.5 degrees is dead. It failed. You know, it's not, it's, not, it's not a fragile, tenuous agreement. It is basically. And scientists are saying, if, if all of these nations hold to their pledge, we're still looking at 2.4 degrees rise by the end of the century and more likely heading up towards 3 degrees centigrade, which is, I mean, if you, any of you have, look at that on the geological timescale, you know, it's just, it, it's just, it, it's, it's, I, it, it is very, very, very shocking. So how do we deal with this? <laughs> we, just rebel, we just keep on doing what we're doing. Um, you know, I, I try not to get too depressed about what's going on. I get angry, I get frustrated about the political situation. But, you know, there's such an extraordinary community of people out there doing really, really inspirational work. And that's where I keep going. I keep going towards the light and towards the inspiration. 
and finding out where there is potentially the most agency Nature to make change. Nature is incredibly strong and robust. If you give it space and you give it what it needs, it comes back. But we are still chipping away at it and extracting from it and... and you know, hearing what was being said earlier about Surrey having such declining rates of wildlife. And, you know, it just, it just always makes my heart and my stomach kind of, you know, clutch and clench. And, you know, the State of Nature report that the UK is 196 worst for nature um, depletion in the world. And yet, you know, one is led to believe that somehow it's always slightly different. We're sort of shown these, you know, pictures of our, you know, our kind of green and glorious land. But actually, most of that green is enriched pasture land for, for grazing of animals. And actually, this country is so rich in heathland. Really, you know, we have, which is rarer than some of the tropical forests. You know, heathlands are incredibly beautiful That's repository. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> another question. Yeah, thank you. I didn't think anybody was asking questions. What's your next project? Um, so we're working on four pieces for next year at the moment. One with Zena um, Edwards, Hopefully, maybe for Lewisham, uh, Borough of Culture 2022, but it's still, it's still at stages that we have to find all of the full funding. We have the idea, it's kind of working title of Seven Poet Trees, um, and sort of working with um, poets being placed into communities and into schools, but then working towards a really kind of, a, a little bit like the tree ceremony piece that would happen in a central location. We've also just uh, moved our 100 Boyce's acorn oak trees that we've been growing from acorns from outside the Tate Modern to the Paper Garden in London. And we're doing a, some permanent planting of those trees uh, seven of them will be planted around the Tate over, over the coming months. Well, two at Tate and five in the vicinity. And actually Southwark, we had, um, we've had two or three conversations. Southwark are planting 10,000 trees between 2021 and 2022. And thereafter, up until 2030, 8,000 trees a year. So we could be looking at 70,000 trees just in Southwark. I was reading earlier that Hackney and Enfield are pledging to plant 136,000 trees. Um, and this is about, well, for Southwark, it's about honouring their, their, their um, declaration of a climate emergency. Well over 50%, it might be even more now, councils throughout the UK have declared a climate emergency. So this is part of what they're doing. Um, so there's a lot more information that we're looking at into that. And possibility of doing the tree ceremony in Rouen. Uh, they're doing a really big nature, um, naturation programme. And we are going to be going to the 23rd Sydney Biennale, which we thought very long and hard about. But actually, we're, we're connected with a youth activist movement there called Seed Mob, which is working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait um, youth activists. And in fact, one of them was involved. Will Potter did a wonderful uh, in conversation. Well, he did a piece to, to camera for Culture Declares Emergency, a digital platform called The Offer. So, and possibly a piece in Paris. I mean, there's just a number of things, but mainly Boyce's acorns is, is an important one, yeah. Um, very beautiful work. Um, I had the question, because you touched on the pasture land and obviously the grass coats that they're wearing, that's more representative of like our destruction on the land by cutting down trees and creating agricultural locations so how do you deal with that in your work i think i mean for us the grass is very much just a, a symbol of a living thing grasses are incredibly important uh, most of our grains and foods are a type of grass and, and it's yeah it's i mean it's certainly not about lawns to us we we know the damage that, that lawns create there's something very beautiful about the uniformness of it as grown as a fabric, the light sensitivity of it, the photographic pieces that we do and things. So it, it's more, it's to do with the photosynthesis and the chlorophyll 
more than the... Yeah, the I mean, it is a special grass that we use, but... We sometimes just talk about the potentiality of that first shoot, that first, that first blade. We go to great lengths to step away from sod, from turf, from lawn, because, yes, we are understandably critical of that. But we're, use, we're, trying to, you know, we're often subverting the material, growing it up buildings... Or we are, as Dan says, you know, really exploring the light sensitivity of chlorophyll. And actually, grass does have a wonderful uniformity. But it is the most successful flowering plant on the surface of the planet. You know, a grass that grows in the chalk, chalklands down in Sussex, you can also find growing, you know, on the slopes of, um, of Everest in, um, you know, far, far away. So, and also, humans have evolved with grasses. And it's, a mo- you know, rice, barley, wheat, corn, you know, it's all part of the grass family. And that's been part of our problem because we're cutting more and more forests down so that we can grow more crops. Yeah, it's complex. Thank you. I think sadly we'll have to move on now, but that was so powerful. Thank you both so much. And now I'd like to introduce Darrow Montag as our second speaker. Thank you. Thank you. I also uh, just uh, want to ask the UCA students to come in. Are you okay there, or do you want to come and sit here? here we go. <laughs> because um, they're helping with the uh, block print activity there, um, which you'll be able to do straight after the talks as well. So, I used to be a visual artist, had a particular area of interest in the gap between art and science. And the work that I did focused on the natural world and um, how that natural world could be understood and represented as a series of interconnected events rather than a collection of objects in motion. For many years, I worked with microorganisms and enabled them to produce images directly on photographic films. These are not photographs of microorganisms, but the record of their activities as they eat their way across the film's gelatin surface. I've also produced work in collaboration with small animals, such as snails and toads, and natural phenomena such as wind and rain. In these works, the animals or events scratch a trace of their passing on sheets of glass. And this elegant drawing is made by a snail as it browses its way across a sheet of algae-coated glass. And this slide shows a series of drawings made by toads You can see their claw marks and even the warty bellies as they touch down on the glass. So in these, the glass is coated with carbon. And a bamboo blowing in the wind has the feeling of Eastern calligraphy. And during this time, I was particularly interested in such questions as how may we creatively collaborate with non-human species? In what way are the non-humans creative? And what do we actually mean by creativity? But that's not what I'm here to talk about today. In the 30 years since I first started this work, much has happened. Instead, I'm going to explore another interest, and that is the soil. The soil and its ability to help reduce the severity of climate change. This slide shows a series of artworks made by microorganisms found in healthy soil. Firstly, we need to understand that soil is a living entity and it needs to be respected. It is not an inert substance in which a large number of animals, bacteria and fungi live, These living organisms are all connected in a web of exchanges, a collaborative matrix 
where all the individual entities are interdependent and entwined. As many of you will know, our living soil is currently put under severe strain and pressure. It is being damaged by erosion, pollution, compaction, and loss of organic content. Now we can't cover all of that in 20 minutes, so I'd like to focus on a way we can actually improve our damaged or poor soils, especially ones that are low in organic matter. And at the same time, we can help to counteract the carbon we've been pumping into the atmosphere. The science behind this is simple and has been known about for some time. It is based on a technology that goes back many centuries. This technology seems to have been understood by some of the original inhabitants of South America. Long before the European invaders arrived, the original inhabitants of the Amazon rainforest used this technique to improve their poor quality soil. In more recent times, it is being reconsidered as a potential method for locking carbon into the ground and keeping it out of the air. In its simplest form, this technology involves three stages. Creating carbon, crushing it, and then spreading it on the ground. By adding crushed charcoal to the soil, you are effectively putting carbon into the ground rather than into the atmosphere. This is carbon sequestration in its simplest form. The method exploits the hard work done by trees to suck carbon out of the atmosphere. All trees do this throughout their life as they use the carbon to help build wood. By taking this wood and turning it into charcoal and burying it in the soil, we complete a carbon negative process. The carbon is moved from our atmosphere into the ground. There are many ways to produce charcoal. I've been using a kiln and I'll show you a short film of this process in a few minutes. There are more efficient ways of creating charcoal than burning wood. Sorry, there are more efficient ways of creating charcoal than burning wood in a kiln. But as I mentioned earlier, I'm an artist and the efficient and the aesthetic are sometimes in competition. Organic matter that has been turned into charcoal is a relatively pure form of carbon. Not only that, but it is quite stable. That is to say, it does not readily decompose and turn back into carbon dioxide, which, as we all know, contributes to the greenhouse effect. Microorganisms do not like to eat it, so when buried in soil, it generally stays there. Whilst it is possible to bury large chunks of charcoal, for most soil conditions, it is better to crush it and bury it as a powder. In this form, it is known as biochar. Twelve years ago, I started looking into this form as, a, as an art act, from an art activist perspective. Having recently returned from an expedition to Peru with Cape Farewell, the organisation linking the arts to climate change, I became aware of the way indigenous people had used charcoal to improve the poor Amazonian soils. So I decided to learn more about charcoal. In common with most artists, my only previous experience of handling charcoal had been using it as a drawing medium. But this new project required me to make my own supply of charcoal, crush it into powder, and bag it up into one kilogram sacks. These small sacks were exhibited as an artwork and given away at a number of galleries. Whoever took a sack was required to sprinkle or bury the biochar 
at or near their home. Once this was done, they filled in the details of where it had been deposited and sent the card back to the return address. These locations were then logged and added to a global map, and it was heartening to witness the engagement of the public in this process. Or perhaps it was the promise of a free artwork that generated the interest. We don't have time to make biochar this afternoon, but I'll now show you a short film to give you an idea of the process. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. <laughs> Deforestation is a major factor in this. But we also know that trees draw carbon out of the atmosphere during their lifetime. So how can chopping down trees be good for the planet? How can burning wood be anything but bad? Surely burning wood will only contribute to increasing temperatures. Whilst this is true in normal combustion, there is a process where burning wood can be beneficial. It is called pyrolysis. During their lifetime, plants absorb carbon. They get this from the carbon dioxide in the air. Most of the tree's structure is provided by carbon combined with hydrogen and oxygen the two components of water. When a tree decomposes or is burnt, nearly all of its carbon is released into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide or water in the form of steam. If, however, the wood can be burnt without oxygen, the carbon cannot combine with it to make carbon dioxide. Instead, it remains unburnt as carbon. This black substance is what we know as charcoal. This process has been known about for centuries, but until recently, charcoal was used mainly as a source of fuel, and a small amount was used in other industries, and even as a drawing tool for artists. But there is another way this charcoal can be used. When it is crushed into a powder, it can be used as a soil conditioner. In this form, it is called a biochar. But, and here is the interesting thing, adding it to soil not only helps increase the organic content of the soil, it also increases the carbon content. In other words, making biochar and spreading it on the soil has the overall effect of taking carbon out of the atmosphere and locking it in the ground where it stays for a very long time. So, 
So, although burning wood to make charcoal may appear a negative thing, it actually can be the opposite. It can be used as a process to take carbon out of the atmosphere. And this is one small way I have been helping to reduce my carbon footprint. But, before we get too excited, I should probably point out the enormity of the task. The average UK adult's daily contribution to carbon dioxide gases is nearly 30 kilograms, or 10 tonnes per annum. Obviously, not all of this is carbon. Just over two-thirds of the weight of carbon dioxide is actually oxygen. If we take this out of the equation, we are left with about eight kilograms of pure carbon every single day. And to show you what this looks like, I've brought eight kilogram bags. So this is approximately the daily amount of carbon sent into the atmosphere by an average UK citizen. There's about 60 of you in this room, so we can probably imagine what 60 times this amount might look like. And remember, this is just one day's carbon emissions. If, after reading this, you feel inspired to offset your emissions for one year, you would be looking at a heap of charcoal or carbon that weighs three tons, or 3,000 of these bags. And of course, moving this around would use further carbon. So whilst it is not impossible to genuinely offset our emissions, for most of us, this is quite a physical challenge. In addition to the physical task of moving three tons of charcoal and crushing it and into a powder, the cost might also prevent one or two of you from doing this. A well-known online shop named after the same Brazilian rainforest mentioned earlier sells charcoal for about two pounds per kilogram. So, if you wanted to totally offset just one year of emissions, you might need to budget about 6,000 pounds per annum. It seems that carbon so, so it seems that zero carbon could be quite expensive. 
We also need to be careful that any charcoal that does get used in this way comes from a local renewable resource. It does not make sense to import tons of charcoal from another country in order to improve our soil and offset our emissions over here. But the good news is that for the purpose of making biochar, we do not need good quality wood. In fact, all sorts of organic matter can be used, including waste material from the production of food or even the waste products after the consumption of food, namely manure. Basically, anything that has a good carbon content. So this talk has lasted approximately 20 minutes. Based on an average daily carbon usage of eight kilograms, each one of us has effectively contributed 100 grams of carbon to the atmosphere during this talk. So I've brought along some small bags, each of which contains about 100 grams of biochar. And so I therefore propose that we each take a bag and spread it on some soil outside to offset, offset the length of time you've had to listen to me. And this talk can therefore be genuinely carbon neutral. So please take one and follow me outside. I didn't bring a dress with a pocket, so I'm going to have to hold this. Um, so that's me. I, have, I work very embedded in scientific settings, and so um, I'm actually here this week. I got um, an Institute of Advanced Studies Fellowship to be artist in residence in the um, Department of Health and Medical Sciences in the Veterinary School, and I'm studying zoonotic diseases um, this, this week. So I combine two things, which obviously cuts down on the travel, which is nice. Um, but I also have all these other many affiliations, which I won't go through now, but you'll see the artworks in due course. And I want to talk a bit more broadly as well, I think, about... Um, about things, I mean, we're talking about climate change, but also pollution and things like that. So antibiotic resistance is a big issue for me. So this is the idea that bacteria are gaining uh, resistance to the antibiotics that we've used to treat them since the start of the antibiotic age, which is 1941. And... Uh, this is a sort of experiment I did here on um, making an MRSA quilt. So MRSA is methicillin resistant Staph aureus. It's resistant to um, the methicillin group of um, antibiotics that we'd use to treat it. And the blue is the MRSA bacteria and the patterns on it are created with different antibiotics. So the idea is that the work um, reveals the tools and techniques um, in the treatment and diagnosis of this disease. So people that want to come and see the artwork, that's a little bit of it, it's a big quilt, um, they, can, they can kind of approach it and ask questions and explore through it these different things. So, for instance, vancomycin susceptibility discs, which they use in the lab to see if your infection could be treated with vancomycin, actually, for my purposes, they make really nice polka dots on, uh, on the cloth. And so this is all sterilised in an autoclave, so it's safe to take out and exhibit in a gallery. Um, but it's this huge issue, um, and we, we now know through the tools that we have, which are genomics tools, so we can look at the whole genome sequences of these bacteria, we're starting to gain a greater understanding of how they can transfer these resistance genes and which bacteria have it and which don't. Mm, that way? No? Maybe that? There. <laughs> um, and... Bacteria, I was just having a conversation before I came here about antibiotic resistance in tuberculosis. And if you get TB, um, which currently infects a, a quarter to a third of the world's population, probably pushing towards a third at the moment because the symptoms are hugely similar to COVID in the early stages, coughing, night sweats, things like that. Um, and so a lot of TB has gone untreated during the pandemic. People couldn't get access to it or they mistook it and thought they had uh, COVID. So they've been treated for COVID. Um, <clears throat> but so we have this situation where you've got a, 
um, huge number of people. Of course, not all of them will get sick from it. A lot of us have um, natural immunity or we've been vaccinated. Um, but in, in um, low to middle income countries, um, there's a much higher burden. Um, and in places like um, Russia, um, Eastern Europe, um, um, and India and Africa, there's much higher burden of tuberculosis, so it's really common. And if you think back, up, up until like the 1960s, we were having, you know, um, x-rays, chest x-rays and things in this country, there was a programme to do that. And it was only when they brought in the BCG vaccination that that became less necessary. But now, um, the BCG vaccination is becoming less effective as well. So what we want to do is obviously keep it out. Um, this is a pneumothorax machine that I've altered from the 1950s. And this was a treatment for um, tuberculosis before they had um, good working antibiotics. So what they would do, so it, they used it up till about the 1950s, but it was from about the 30s. Um, they would introduce air into the chest cavity um, in order to collapse one lung from the patient um, to give that lung a rest they said. So the rest cure was the only treatment you had for TB. Um, rest, rest, rest was what the public health leaflets would say. And this is one that I've altered. So it's carved with the images of um, tuberculosis effect on the lungs. Um, and a lot of scientists who've seen this exhibited, because I took this over to Tashkent in Uzbekistan as part of the Médecins Sans Frontières conference on Eastern Europe, um, tuberculosis in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Asia. And that had scientists coming, they'd never seen this kind of bio art before or anything. Um, uh, but they were from like Afghanistan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan. Um, and, you know, and they straight away pointed at it and said, that's the lungs with TB. So it is what it kind of looks like, although it's quite a severe case, I can admit here. And so it's, it's carved with this. And the images on the cylinder there are the classic scattered red ribbons that you see if you look at TB under a microscope. And the reason I'm showing you this is they've done trials again recently in India um, as a treatment for extensively drug-resistant TB because the drugs don't work on it. So maybe if we don't stop this issue of antibiotic resistance, we'll be going back to these kind of treatments. But I mean, I think we can recognise treatments like that from the early stages of COVID as well. But it kills, TB kills um, one and a half million people a year. And if you're used to the figures of, you know, COVID deaths, you can tell it's a pretty significant, it's one of the largest infectious killers. COVID's overtaken it this year, but I'm sure it'll be back up again once the, the COVID rates um, go down. Um, because, and, and that's every year. That's been every year and, and more before. So it's, it's a hugely important thing. Um, and I'm interested in um, the sort of solutions I'm interested in, things like synthetic biology. So we have tools now like um, genetic modification and also working with non-canonical amino acids. So you can actually, living things are made of a combination of 20 amino acids. We're, we're, we're like more, more than 20 in us, but but just a combination of 20. Um, there's actually 64 in the world, so different living things have different amino acids in them. But the scientists now can work with 21, 22, 23 amino acids. And if you're trying to create an antibody against um, a disease, then this gives you a, a much larger pool of things to test. And I work with scientists at University of California, Irvine, um, who were working with um, engineering antibodies that bind quite well to HIV. And this is, and they use this metaphor all the time of the string of beads, of the amino acids as a string of beads. And so I made a string of beads, and this um, this is the actual antibody in its amino acid sequence inside the bead. So each anti, each amino acid is crystallised inside the bead um, in its exact sequence, 452 beads long, and then bound into the exact protein structure of the antibody. And behind that is the image of an antibody under the microscope, uh, uh, not under the microscope, as they show it in textbooks, but it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, it's a very abstract thing. There's a lot of abstraction in science and it's all dyed with Kumasi blue, which is used to dye DNA in the labs. But it used to be a wool dye in the olden days. 
Um, and I also modified a bacteria to calve, because you actually do this on a plasmid, which is a circular piece of DNA, and a lot of antibiotic resistance is transferred through these plasmids, which, if you think about it, are a bit like a USB dongle that you put in your computer that gives it a bit of an upgrade. So the bacteria kind of share these kind of bacterial dongles, if you like. Um, but I like to think of them as necklaces. Um, so I, I thought of it as a necklace that the bacteria could wear inside itself. So I inserted a plasmid with the engineered antibody into the bacteria and had one amino acid in the whole sequence was, was random. And if that one produced what's called a stop codon, where it tells the DNA to stop replicating, um, it would grow one colour on this agar. And where it didn't have the stop codon, it would grow the other colour, so blue or white. I can't remember which way round it is. I'm a, I apologise for that. <laughs> but the thing is, it's exactly the same bacterium. The only difference is one amino acid change. And it makes that, you know, huge change in colour. Um, I've done a lot of projects about could we repair antibiotic resistance with CRISPR, um, which is this very cutting edge, cut and paste technique for editing DNA, editing genomes. And I did what the CRISPR journal said was the first project using CRISPR as an art project. Um, and it's called Make, Do and Mend. Um, I haven't got time to go into all the details of it, um, but I edited a, an E. coli that had an ampicillin resistance gene on its genome, edited it out and repaired it with the phrase make, do and mend. And the reason for this is it was all stemming from the start of the antibiotic age is 1941. It's when we were looking at these leaflets that said make, do and mend. And Gene editing has a lot of metaphors of patching and repairing. So I was thinking about that and I was also thinking about... Um, in 1941, they launched the, um, it's called the um, utility mark, which you might remember some of you were stamped on clothing and furniture and things that were using resources um, well. But of course, antibiotics weren't used in the same way. That, that was the start, that's the first tests of antibiotics, but they've been overused. They're used in agriculture. 70% of antibiotics in the world are used in agriculture as a growth promoter for things like cattle and um, factory farming and issues like that. Um, and my late father went to the doctors in, in I think, about the 19, late 1940s. And the doctor said to him, um, would you like some of this whilst you're here? And my dad said, I don't know, what is it? And he said, well, it's penicillin tonic. And my dad said, well, what's that good for? And the doctor said, ever so good for aftershave. So you can imagine that in the past, um, we haven't had a very good understanding of antibiotic resistance, and we still don't. So part of my work is about advocating for that. And so this, war, this actual, and, and they called it CC41, Controlled Commodity 1941 was the utility mark. Um, and this is an actual suit from 1941 that had that mark on it. And I've patched it with textiles that I've grown with the E. coli that I patched with the phrase make, do and mend after knocking out the antibiotic resistance gene, which no scientist would ever do because you usually put antibiotic resistance genes into bacteria so you can grow them and test whether some, something's gone into the bacteria or not and it's kind of like a kill switch. So it's the opposite way of doing it. Um, I'm not saying it's a solution um, by any means to antibiotic resistance, but it's talking about the future technology and then asking the question, well, that technology led to this situation. What will this technology lead to? Are we always playing catch up with our next new innovation? Um, um, I work also with other infectious diseases. This is me holding a petri dish of plague um, at Porton Down. Um, where I learned to handle it. And this is my plague dress, which is impregnated. Um, it's a 1665 dress design, stuffed full of all the lovely things that the plague doctors used to carry around with them to ward off the plague. Um, the embroidery on the front is an actual period embroidery from the, from the era, and it's impregnated with the extracted DNA of plague that I extracted in a lab. Um, so I'm quite trained up in this. I originally trained in fine art, but I've been working in labs for um, about 20 years to make my artworks. Oops, sorry, going the wrong way. Um, there's a close-up. And it's on at the Boerhaave Museum until July, if you happen to get to Leiden in the, in the near future. An amazing show they've got on there called Contagion. Also did projects, um, this is about antibiotic 
um, targeting and genomics. It's a project with Oxford University. So it's a big immersive installation where you learn that antibiotics need to be targeted. There's a lot more detail, but I don't really have time to go into it. Um, this piece is called Archaeobot, a post-singularity, post-climate change life form. And it's based on archaea, which are one of the branches on the tree of life. Um, so we've got the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukaryotes, which are us, and plants, and anything with a nucleus. Um, and archaea, um, a lot of them are extremophiles. And this one's based, this, it's an underwater robotic installation um, that... Um, based on this particular archaea called Sophilobus acidol caldarius. There'll be a test later, so I hope you've remembered that. Um, and it, um, it loves to live in very hot, very acidic places. It's happy up to 80 degrees, and it's considered to be one of the oldest life forms on Earth. So if you think about it from the archaea perspective, all this climate change malarkey is pretty good news. Um, so it's kind of like we're thinking about things from, from our own perspective rather than the microorganisms. It also loves acid. So acid rain, brilliant for the archaea. So the idea of this work, and it's a robot that also contains a neural network, so it's actually learning about its environment as well. And we're kind of talking about kind of future fears, so, um, and also dystopian solutions. So if you think about Elon Musk wanting to put a sunshade over the Earth or something like that and put that into orbit, I mean, it only takes a few missteps, I think, from, from some of these tech trillionaires that they're coming to be. Um, and we'll all end up uploading our consciousnesses to neural networks networks and living on in robotic underwater archaea like this and um, this is a piece that we've got on show I made this work with Alex May um, this is a piece that we've got on show in the Museo Bolivariano in Colombia at the moment so that's just launched and it's a video installation so we've put them into the real world setting but um, yeah and there's another there's a lot of crumbled buildings. So there's me. I do all the work hands-on in the lab, and that's me at Boku University, where we created this work, also with Alex May. And it contains um, a yeast that we created in the lab. So the scientists there were working with one yeast that was able to capture carbon and output animal feed. And some other scientists were working with a different species of yeast that could... Um, eat glucose and output lactic acid. And lactic acid can be polymerized to make 3D printing filament, PLA it's called. So this um, yeast that we created that's in there um, has the ability to capture carbon from the atmosphere and output lactic acid. So you can basically make plastic from the, from the, uh, from the carbon in the atmosphere. And then it biodegrades very, very quickly um, in about six weeks um, if you put it in like manure or something like that. So um, you could actually recapture the carbon and then make more plastic with it. So it's in the early stages. Um, lactic acid is toxic to the yeast. So you have to keep evolving the um, yeast towards being tolerant of the lactic acid. But who knows? Um, after we you know, progress this for a while this, um, with the scientists, then um, it might work. And so the, the images on there are based on the um, yeast that we grew in the lab. And that one up the top there, that sort of white one, that's actually made with the lactic acid um, produced by the yeast. So um, it's producing small quantities, but it did, it did manage it. Um, and this is another piece about how culture and the history of yeast is linked. And actually, there's hypothesis that we actually kind of started forming cultures so we could brew beer and bake bread and grow crops for this, mainly the beer. It's called the drunken monkey hypothesis, actually, as <laughs> part of this, is that yeast has evolved to use us as a, as, a, as a means of proliferation. So it's very successful, the Saccharomyces cerevisiae. You've probably all got some in your cupboard, um, especially after the pandemic when everyone's been break, baking bread. And this one contains a very cutting-edge yeast because they found out the mechanism in the lab of, the, um, of how to make other yeasts, not just Saccharomyces cerevisiae, produce um, to ferment. So this is actually made with a Picchia pastoris yeast. The bread was fermented with a completely different yeast than would ever be used um, until now. Maybe in the future you'll be able to use it. 
and there's some more images that we made of 3D scans of the yeast. Also working with plant CRISPR, this is um, a, um, a chicory plant, which um, was a great inspiration for um, the German Romantic movement. And um, I think Goethe, he, he was inspired to write his metamorphosis of plants based on seeing the chicory plants, which in German folklore are kind of at the roadside and grown from the tears of maidens and things like that. It's a very, very romantic idea. And the German romanticism, in fact, romanticism in general, was, a, was the opposite. It was against the Industrial Revolution. They hated the Industrial Revolution. But now the scientists we're working with are studying this plant um, and knocking out the bitter terpenes to produce this amazing dietary fibre called inulin, which is a prebiotic that some of you might even be regularly consuming here. And they're trying to make the inulin production better. And they're knocking out genes rather than introducing genes. So it's not a transgenic plant. It's just something that could occur in, in um, normal growth, but it would take much, much longer. So, so they're looking at that and then studying you know, talking to farmers and talking to different groups, would you be happy with this or not? So that's what they're interested in at the moment. And so it's now at the heart of the new biotechnological revolution and what our acceptance or not will be of that. And uh, Goethe said that you could grow, he believed that you could grow any plant just from its leaf. Obviously, most of you will think you can't, uh, maybe, unless, of course, you know that you can grow it on agar with the plant growth factors in it. And then you can even actually grow a plant just from a cell. So um, kind of Goethe was right, but um, it took a few... Uh, took quite a while, hundreds of years, to, uh, to actually be able to do that. And that's the, the tiny plant cells. These are ones that I crispered in the lab, so I modified and knocked out some terpenes in. I'm also studying the collateral effects of the pandemic, and this is a, this is a work that I'm starting to develop around that, a new cholera dress, working with scientists in the Sanger. And back to climate change again, um, I did an experiment. I'm doing a residency at um, the Helmholtz Centrum in um, Munich, and um, they are studying epigenetics and stem cells. This is quite like a, a, a kind of a leap of complexity. Um, but they, um, they look at how DNA replicates and if the bits of machinery in DNA replication ever confl conflict with each other, because you can get two bits and sometimes in the cell they'll conflict and this may be a driver of mutation. Um, and I was very interested in whether temperature affected this because I read an article by it was it was an American article and it was quite niche to a certain area in America but they studied and the human body temperature of the people they studied over 20 years had gone down quite substantially like point like nearly half a degree or something and they think it might be to do with less inflammation so I said well could we study this and the scientist was a that's a brilliant idea because um it's really easy. We don't even need that many tools or anything. We don't have to introduce anything, modify anything. We can just test temperature on it. But he said, well, it might be better to test hotter temperatures. And I was like, well, this would be good for, like, would climate change affect these transcription replication conflicts? Like, would a higher temperature or fever? So we used the, um, these are a human cell line, and we grew them at 37 degrees and at 42 degrees and then dyed the transcription replication conflicts using fluorescent dyes and what we found was that at 42 degrees the cells replicate much more slowly but they also had more transcription replication conflicts per per growth cycle so um, he likened it to um, uh, and this was Stefan Hempel in the lab. He likened it to cars driving on a, you know, on a motorway. So the normal body temperature is like a car driving along at its, um, at its um, normal you know, speed on good weather, good conditions and things like that. Um, but this, is like a, this one at 42 is like a car driving in fog. Um, and you, obviously you drive slower when you're in fog, but you also have more accidents. Um, I don't know how it extends more broadly than that. It's an experiment we tried, um, and we're trying lots of other things at the moment. But yeah, you can see these. These are the. This is the image of that research, and so that's, that's some of my supporters, and that's the end of the talk. Thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, if you want to.
follow me. You can follow me there. <laughs> Are there any questions for Anna? <laughs> terrify everyone. <laughs> <laughs> It's fascinating. I mean, how did you start off working with scientists? Um, it was a, a long time ago, really. So um, if you think back to when the World Wide Web kind of first became available, so I was an art student, and then you could kind of Google, well, not Google, because before Google, you could Netscape Navigator or something, Ask Jeeves or one of those things. Um, and you could start to look up things that wouldn't be in your normal thing that you could stumble upon in the art college library in the newspaper on the four or five channels or whatever you had access to. So, um, so when that came available, I started to kind of discover that I found out that E. coli bacteria, rather than being just a food poisoning thing that I thought it was um, at that time, because that's all I'd ever heard, was actually necessary to digest the food in your gut. If you don't have E. coli living on you, there's something very wrong with you. So, um, and uh, yeah, probably wouldn't be able to digest food properly. It's part of it's a central part of the gut microbiome. So when I realised that, and this predates the concept of the microbiome as we know it today as well, um, I started to look into that. And there was a concept called normal flora microbiology that was the normal, they don't do anything, they're, not, they're just there, they're normal flora, and they're not pathogens and they're not beneficial, so they're just there. Um, and they were considered to be of no commercial or medical interest. And so I started to study them as an artist and took it from there. And now they're obviously of commercial and medical interest because... And that's because of the tools that we have to study it, which are genomics tools. So now we can see what they're, what's really going on there a bit more. I mean, we don't know what's really going on most of the time, but uh, to an extent we do. Any questions? They're all frightened of me. <laughs> I know, I can't claim well, to understand access it Access to plague. <laughs> Mm. on at the moment and that I was quite fascinated with the colours that you were producing with the, the, um, the different experiments and mm. creating and I, um, I, I just would like to know how I would find out more about those. Which particular ones well, was it? Well I was thinking it? about the blues but really the any. Blue. Yeah. With the blue with the, with the antibody or with the bacteria growing on the blue? <laughs> you can test my knowledge now. They're, they're different. Was I really listening? So, um, so the blue that the bacteria are growing on into the, for the quilt that's, um, that's what's called a chromogenic agar. So the growth medium has dyes in it, which in the presence of this particular bacterium turn blue. So it's a diagnostic test that they use in hospital labs. Not so much now because... Yeah, a chroma... Hmm? You've got it <laughs> hmm. Not so much now because they use more, more sort of black box tools to ID bacteria. But um, like maybe 10 years ago, we were doing this a lot or even less. Um, so there's that. And then the other one was dyed with Kumasi blue, which is used to de dye DNA quite a lot. Um, but originally it was a wool dye. About 100 years ago it was being used as a wool dye. It's a chemical dye. There's a, a huge relationship of microbiology and dye. It goes back a long time. And, yeah, I'm fascinated with it. <laughs> Let's have a conversation afterwards. I'm <laughs> dominating now. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you so much, Anna. There's one other one. Oh, one more. <laughs> Hi, Anna. That was really Hi. fascinating. Um, it's really clear to see how your work is influenced by science. I'm just curious to find out how your work influences science mm. as an artist. So you can see that in your work. Mm. I mean, Maybe some examples of that. So sometimes... So I'll take this in two different directions because sometimes academics want to know what impact did you have on changing the scientist's mind as a kind of impact thing. And I sort of, I'm very resistant to that. So I stay out of um, those academic debates because I think making art is the main goal for, for me and art that is for everyone. Um, but in terms of having me in the lab, there's a process that they go through, which is the ideas and the idea generation. And I'm like the, the lab at the Helmholtz, we're, we're starting quite a major project that's never been tried before. That's something that I've suggested. Um, so it, it, it takes you in new kind of scientific directions. But also a lot of scientists, um, they love it because um, they love their subject, but they also 
I'm fascinated in, you know, art, or maybe they're not so fascinated in art, and then seeing art about their favourite subject, well, then they get it. So, so there's that change as well. And then you can have discussions around the aesthetical, like, implications and the ethical implications. They're conversations they don't normally have in the lab in the same way. So it brings that sort of outside cultural perspective too, and then hopefully as a two-way thing. Thank you. What was one up there? I collaborate with him up there. Wave him Sorry, at the back. Just, um, <laughs> As Alex, that I've done a lot of projects yeah, with. Yeah, I just obviously you collaborate with the scientists, but I just wondered what your collaboration was with other art practitioners. Um, only, only with Alex, and we worked together on on some of the pieces. So yeah, I don't tend to work with a lot of other artists because I'm I'm quite difficult to work with probably <laughs> no I'm not I mean, um, but uh, <laughs> um, it, it, it's just I have uh, I have a vision <laughs> and so you know it's 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 about getting that out there thank you so much thank you, Anna. Thank you. <laughs> now can I introduce Will Nash Okay, I, I probably use this slide in more talks than anything else. And I took this picture um, about 20 years ago at the Sagrada Familia. It's, um, there's a little museum which has kind of got a lot better. Uh, but it's, uh, it's Gaudi's sort of little illustration of him figuring out the, um, the sort of parabolic geometry of, um, of, of how, the, how tree roots and branches form. And um, uh, I think at the time, I guess I was sort of recently out of art school and uh, trying to figure out what my sculpture was and what my practice was and uh, sort of realising that um, sort of the geometry, math, sequencing uh, in, in sort of in nature, you know, this idea, Gaudi, Gaudi's idea was that everything was in the book of nature. Uh, and, and that sort of, I guess, when he's talking about nature, he's talking about everything, like, like the um, sort of deep physical uh, nature of, of, the, of the universe. And so I kind of have, have sort of really, I guess, in retrospect, see that that's really all I've been doing ever since. Uh, and my work is is sort of, I guess, I guess it, it's, it's ended up in, a, in quite a public space uh, in that I do public commissions for, um, you know, usually quite large outdoor sculpture. And the stuff I'm going to talk about is probably the last sort of three to four years. Uh, and my work has been sort of, I guess, like maybe a bit like the other speakers and probably most of you here, it, you know, it, it's the, the alarm bells are ringing, and we're we're sort of, as artists or whatever kind of practitioners we are, we're sort of responding in our own ways, and hopefully using the tools and the knowledge we have to sort of take us in in the right sort of direction, and hopefully help um, you know uh, write the warning, as it were. So this piece is um, like actually all the pieces I'm going to talk about is uh, fairly local. This is near Horsham at Warnham Nature Reserve, uh, and it's called the Bat Bothy. Um, it was a sort of unusual for me, this project, in that uh, we had... Um, it wasn't a commission. It was sort of something that I, I instigated with uh, a project manager. Um, we got some money from uh, Arts Council, a few different bits and bobs, and we put together a project for the Nature Reserve, which was trying to sort of, you know, bring more people to the reserve and, and do, sort of, do some kind of cross-cultural sort of natural world um, meets sort of poetry and sculpture. And uh, I, I was so, sort of a little bit ambivalent about the project. I, I, it was kind of, you know, in a way, I was sort of brought in uh, and didn't really have, have much of an idea of what I was going to do. But we had these old bits of architectural columns uh, which we were sort of hanging the project on that 
and uh, it pretty quickly became clear that there, there was this really strong group of friends at the Nature Reserve, and they really didn't like what I was offering at all. Uh, and, and there was sort of, like, I had my presentation a bit like this, and I had these people, and they were really unimpressed with what I was offering. So, so it was kind of, and it's happened to me before. It's not, it's not that unusual if you do this sort of thing. Um, and it, but what, what I've kind of come to realise with those things is to try to sort of recognise them as an opportunity. Uh, and so I wasn't that thrilled about the columns either. They'd sort of come as part of the package with what we were doing. And so we were able to ditch the columns uh, and... and uh, I sort of flick on. So th th these were the granite columns. They were left over from this, this image on, on, the, on the left here. So we were thinking about this kind of wayfinding scheme for the nature reserve. And it was, all, it was a little bit bland, uh, but, it, but it was sort of, you know, okay, we'll just get it done. And they really didn't like them. So I went to the council depot, and, and they had these pallets of Horsham stone, which you can see here. So there were probably about maybe 20 tonnes of stone uh, in total, and we ended up using about half of it. Uh, and I'm going to sort of skip back a bit. Um, the, the, the nature reserve is an old hammer pond. So hammer pond is something that was, uh, was sort of came about sort of early industrial processes, sort of medieval iron working. And these are the kind of forms you get around that early iron working. Uh, so, so there's all these sort of kind of fairly gothic arches and also these sort of chimney shapes. And uh, I was sort of interested in, okay, maybe, maybe I can do something with this stone and create these, these sort of stacked stone sort of forms that are sort of echoes from this iron working period. And, uh, and they, anyway, they went for that, basically, because I was using a sort of a natural substance sort of, or, or a more natural sort of feeling material. It was, it was the sort of, this sort of granite, they were really anti. And this, this came really from out the ground, you know, within a few miles of reserve, so they were liking it. And the other thing that happened was they took me on a tour of the reserve and they showed me all the different elements that make up a nature reserve, which there are lots of bits to it that you don't really see normally. And there were things like, there were just old sheets of corrugated iron lying around, and they were there for grass snakes. And there was sort of no... You know, there was no sign saying, here are the grass snakes, but they knew that that was a good habitat for grass snakes. So I got interested in the idea of maybe, I, maybe my sculptures could be habitats. And so that, that's where the, sort of, so the iron working was sort of generating the forms and the, um, the, the sort of the, this idea of a habitat sculpture. This, this was the first one, basically. Uh, and I came up with two forms, and they were sort of echoing each other. The curve is the same, but it's just inverted. And we did a little Facebook sort of vote with the Warnham sort of friends. So sort of engaging people all the way through the project. Uh, and you can see here that the, the Bat Bossy Sculpture 2 got 66%. So that, that was the winner. Um, and it sort of, in, sort of uh, involved a local um, uh, sort of... He actually works in Flint usually. This is Chris over here. And he set me off for the first time, you know, my first day as a proper stone waller, uh, and then he left me to it. I got these uh, group of sort of volunteers from the, uh, what's called the Horsham Green Gym, which was sort of a leftover from David Cameron's big government kind of, you know, whatever, big society or whatever he called it. But that was sort of one of, one of like the few positive things that maybe came out of it. Uh, anyway, so, so my form is, you know, it's a mathematical structure. So you see here the, the post in the middle, that, that's, that's actually the centre point of, of, of the shape. And you can see the, uh, the, these um, sort of black stripes on there. They're every 100 mil. So I knew exactly how, what the sort of diameter should be when I reached every 100 mil. So that gave me this, this very sort of soft curve. You can see the mass, just, just well, measurements there. Uh, and you can see here the pencil line. So each pencil line was as I moved up uh, through, through the form... So I was sort of constantly sectioning through the form to, to make sure I stayed on track to get this very, very perfect shape out of something that was quite lumpy and bumpy. So, um, so that, that, was, that was the sort of process. Now, I, it, it's, it's a bat bothy. It, it was designed to be a suitable habitat for local bats. It's right next to the pond, so obviously there's insects there. And, it, and bats like 
uh, old stone walls, old barns, that sort of thing. So, so the inside, which you can see here on, on, the, on the left, uh, is, is a void with lots of bars. So you can sort of imagine the bats now all hanging on the bars. And they also like these little crevices so they can creep in and sort of... The outside is very... It's, it's quite a smooth, symmetrical form, but the inside is very jagged with lots of ledges. So it should be an ideal habitat. Uh, yeah, the, working with the volunteers is, on these sorts of projects is one of the loveliest parts of it for me personally. Because I'm, as an artist or sculptor, I guess I'm quite solitary usually, so I'm just there in my studio making things. So being out in nature and, and having gangs of enthusiastic people, or you know, sometimes less enthusiastic but interesting, you know, it, it's, it, it's a real, you know, I've come to realise that it's a really valuable part of uh, being an artist. You know, they're, they're sort of engaging with people who wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily meet in any other way. I mean, all these guys um, were late 60s, early 70s, and these three here, uh, um, that's Jane in the middle and uh, Phil and Mike, and they basically, they, they, you know, they, they got really involved. They turned up like, every day for a week. You know, they just devoted themselves to it and then offered to come and help on my next project. You know, they, they were completely embedded and engaged with it in, in such a lovely way, and none of them had any interest in art at all. So, uh, you know, they just like being outside and they like chatting and, you know, being physical. So that's the process. Um, I, I'm, yeah, I, I, I love seeing this piece in, in through the seasons. Uh, it's, I, I, need, I really need a picture of it in the snow because it's some, something about putting something quite large out into the landscape and then just seeing time pass, you know, and, and just the signs that the people are moving around it. It's constantly... It's got a path that's worn smooth to it, which is a really lovely thing. So this is the, the second piece I'm going to talk about. This is uh, fairly nearby in, in Shalford Village. Uh, and I've got Tom sitting up there somewhere who, who commissioned this. Uh, it's, it's a swift tower. And um, the brief for this project was a swift tower. So it sort of came up just at the same time as I was working on the bat bossy. And I was like, OK, there's something in this, you know, making a sculpture that things could live in you know so so it's a whole nother audience and it's a silent one but it's one that I can you know perhaps go okay well what would a swift want you know how how, how would that be you know the whole sort of sort of idea of an art you know architecture for for another creature and you know something like a swift it's almost you know as far removed from my experience as a sort of living being uh, it is, is this creature that, you know, can fly for three years, doesn't need to land, you know, it, it lives in the sky, it's like a fish, but in the air. So, so I, I was thinking, you know, sort of basically walking around, thinking about how to figure out what I was going to put forward, and just looking at tall things. And I don't know if you've seen other swift towers, but they're usually quite sort of pedestrian, they're like a house on a post, and so I wanted to make something that felt like it was, it was correct up in the air. So, so that, was, that was the sort of genesis of this. And it's, I think we were talking about grasses earlier. Grass definitely came up, but it's like a seed head. And, and it, was, it was just making something that, that had that sort of quality. Uh, and it also, because swifts are adapted to human architecture, so they're, they're, they're used to nesting in eaves. So my idea was that I make something that has that form, but it has a sort of a series of eaves, so there is a sort of echo of perhaps what they might be looking for. Uh, so that's, yeah, this is, is a bit of an ambitious one, this project, because uh, I, I didn't really realise what, what it would mean to do something 10 metres high, and uh, I, I thought that I needed um, to make something that would house 50 swifts, which, you know, 50 pairs of swift, rather, which is, in retrospect is maybe wildly ambitious for the budget, but, you know, everyone went with it, and so I went with it, so we kept going. And, uh, and it's, you know, it's there, it's, it's done. And this, this will give you an idea of the scale. So there are, uh, I think, yeah, there, there are ten sort of stories, and that you can see there are four, that's four of them, and that, that's, the, that's the two hollow sections. Uh, and... In order to make a swift tower successful, you really need to play swift calls. So there's a little bit of technology in there as well. Uh, this setup here, you can see there's a solar panel, there's a solar controller, there's a little MP3 player, and we basically play swift calls. So, so that 
um, during the season from when they arrive in May to September, we play swift calls sort of morning and evening. Uh, and and that, so that has to be sort of factored in and somebody has to keep an eye on it to make sure it, it's working, um, which I think it still is. Uh, yeah, Tom's nodding. Um, so obviously that's switched off now because they, they're, you know, they're, you know, they've flown 6,000 miles to Africa, so they don't need it at the moment. Uh, yeah. So yeah, this, this sort of key things about, you know, sort of incorporating a habitat into a sculpture or, or making a sculpture a habitat, you know, you're thinking about the entrance size for the swift, they need a particular size hole. If, you, if the holes are too big, suddenly you get starlings moving in. If they're too small, the swifts can't fit. And, and, but then on the other hand, you know, you know, these, these things are just opinions. Because it, you know, swifts will live and make, make a nest in all sorts of odd places. But of course, something sort of becomes almost like a law uh, when, you're, when you're dealing with, uh, you know, I suppose... People become experts, they, they find something that works, and then they sort of put that in writing, and then that's, that's become the only way. But, you know, I, I guess what I'm saying is, uh, as, a, as a sort of sculptor trying to navigate this world of habitat creation, I'm trying to just pull in as much information as I can and make it work, and sort of try and maintain sort of my vision and my aesthetic for, for what I'm trying to, uh, trying to realise. Uh, another sort of facet of these projects, so I usually uh, e either kind of, well, there's two ways I can do it. Like the last one, I involve volunteers and get them to help with the build process and, and get them to help actually select the work. So there's, there's sort of engagement there. And the engagement, the purpose of it, as far as I'm concerned, is you know, just to get people to know about it, to get them on board, and, you know, in particular now with creating habitat sculptures, to get them to, to think that way, to, to have them caring about swifts. So if they understand about swifts, then the next logical step is to care about them. So I see these works as, as sort of like a, a, an outreach kind of education uh, that, that sort of hopefully people are like, well, what the hell's that thing? And then once they find out, then this, they're on a kind of a journey. Uh, so, and and I've, I've sort of witnessed that happening in real time. So, so it does feel like, like it, it's, it's a genuine thing. Like it's not just in my head. So anyway, the other kind of outreach sort of stuff I do is uh, I work with, with, often with schools, diff, different age kids. And in this case, it was a very, you know, it was quite a low budget thing. So I just had two days uh, and we worked with, I think we had about 60 kids through uh, and they all made a bird box each from scratch, you know, from a little kit. Uh, and then they personalised the, the bird boxes on the second day. And I, I kind of came in, I did, them, I did my PowerPoint, I showed them all these, you know, quite elegant and all, mostly sort of quite camouflage-y things <laughs> that, um, you know, made the bird, bo you know, bird boxes sort of fit in and disappear and stuff. And they were like, I'm having none of that. And they all turned up with all sorts of crazy glitter and bits and bobs and things like that. And it was, it was sort of too late by then. And, I, you know, it was just let it, let it go. And so, you know, these bird boxes are all over the village in their back gardens. With, you, know, and I, you know, this is like going back three years now. So I don't dread to think how they look or whether some, some have probably been maintained, others not. But, you know, they, the kids had a great experience. Most of them had never picked up a hammer. Uh, and so it was all, you know, again, you know, you're kind of encouraging them to make things, to think about nature, to all, all these sort of, all the good stuff, really, and kind of hopefully getting them at a young age and just some of them giving them a bit of a nudge. Yeah, so this is, the, this is what it looks like when, on the day when it was coming together. So each part was like a donut slotted on and then hoisted up. So I get to use lots of really big, fun tools to install my stuff. And then there, there it is in, in, the, in the space itself. Uh, and this gives you a sense, I mean, I'm sure some of you know Shalford being local, but some, something that I, that I sort of witnessed and, and have had sort of fed back to me is an interesting effect it's had on that particular corner of, of um, the common at Shalford, which is, uh, this is a cricket pitch, but um, 
And I think it was like there were two things that happened. One was a bank went in. You can see these wildflowers in front. So a little, there was a little bank verge built up between the road and the common. Uh, not high, maybe sort of less than a metre high, and seeded with wildflowers. And the swift tower went in. Oh, and I guess COVID happened as well. So, so, then, so those three things all happened. So suddenly people were meeting up outside, and that little area became this sort of hive of, of people meeting and having picnics and hanging out. And it's sort of like they gathered around it, because it's playing swift calls as well. It sort of has, it's like a little beacon that's sort of flashing at people. So, so it's sort of a term that gets used for public art quite a lot. It's like this placemaking. And, you know, it, it's sort of like, it's kind of nebulous, really. It's like, what's that? But, you know, this, this really does work. As a, you know, it's, it's made a little space where people are, are kind of congregating. Uh, and then it sort of led to other swift towers. So this one um, is only seven metres high. Uh, and the whole thing about the height for Swifts, I might not have mentioned this, is they really need a drop of six metres uh, out, out of their nest. So the low point of any Swift tower really should be around six metres. And again, that you, you can get away, you, you can push that. But, I, but the issue is that when they fledge, if they hit the ground, they can't get off the ground. They don't know how to take off. So, so they need to be high. Um, this is a much smaller version, but you can see the... Uh, I don't know, the other one's the daddy, and this is the little sort of baby swift tower that's gone off. This is up in Norwich, um, outside a hospital. Uh, and I've got, um, uh, yeah, sort of I evolved it as well. I've, I've introduced uh, like a little cup, and I'll even put feathers in, because swifts normally, they, they, they just collect everything on the wing. So anything you can do to give them a bit of a head start is helpful, um, because they, they, you know, they're not going to go and pick stuff up off the ground. It's got to find it in the sky. Uh, the other thing, yeah, I introduced a, a better roof uh, and, and a better sound system, so the, so the swift calls are kind of a, a little bit more audible from, from higher up. And basically, the whole of the, the top cap is now a speaker. So, so I designed it so, so the whole, whole roof resonates and broadcasts the, um, the sounds vertically. So obviously, that's where the swifts are. So, um, so that's, that's a sort of a, a, an evolution. And then I've got two more on the go. And this, is, this design here is, is it, it's actually, I'm not using this design, but I just, you know, this, this is something that's going on this week, really. I'm just finalizing designs. But um, this is for uh, a new tower uh, down in Waterlooville, which is near Portsmouth. And they want, because um, they've got house martins in the area, and, uh, and there's, a, there's a quite a muddy stream running really nearby the, where the tower's going. So it's perfect for house martins. Uh, and I've discovered that uh, house martins and swifts are very happy neighbours. So this is, like, this is now another evolution where I've got house martin nests, which you see just at the bottom. They're the little sort of muddy cup things that they make. Uh, and there'll be room for them to make more. So you add in a few, hopefully they find them and move in, and then they, they add. So, so there's, there's room for at least uh, six uh, house martin sort of pairs and uh, 12 swifts in this one but it won't look like this uh, but this is the site for it uh, the other thing that's kind of nice you know thinking about nudging things along is is that these you know this this is for a developer called LaSalle who, who are absolutely huge um, they got a turnover of something like 50 billion and they're, they're a global organization uh, but they are really interested in, in having is that my cue? Five okay, sorry. Uh, five minutes until then. Good. Now. Shall I stop now? Okay, good. Right, so just, just I'll finish on this. But yeah, LaSalle, you know, they're a, they're a huge organisation. And they, this isn't their only kind of green project. They're really sort of coming on board with the idea of creating green roofs for their big box architecture. Um, making wildlife areas instead of just mown bits around the car parks, all that sort of thing. So, you know, again, it's sort of from a cynical point of view, you could think, well, maybe it's just greenwashing and, you know, it's all optics. But, you know, maybe good things can happen there. Um, I don't know. I, I'm trying to be a bit more optimistic than maybe I feel. But yes, OK, so I can wrap it up and we can do questions. Thank you so much. It was... Um, it 
I've worked with um, Will. I've had the pleasure of working and helping to build the octahedron near uh, Newlands Corner. So if you haven't seen that, you must go and see it. But it was through our discussions there yes. that you were developing these whole ideas about inhabitable sculptures, which... I was so taken with and um, and now we've got the funding for, for Habitat and Will will be one of the artists for that. So, any questions for Will? Hi, Hi Will, thank you, that was really fascinating. Oh, yeah. um, I am interested in, in what are the key motivators for you. Obviously, you've, you've, you've maybe stumbled into this idea of um, working with, with species. But is that the, the tree key trigger or the maths or the problem solving? I'd just like to know well, from a, your personal view as, a, as an artist, what is it that really... Yeah. So, well, I, I had this sort of arc of Gaudi, which I've sort of truncated, as in, I, I think, because I feel like I'm drawing all, all of my forms and, and the kind of way I want to make sculpture from the natural world, you know, from, from how, how things grow, really, I suppose. And... And so it's sort of a logical step to sort of actually welcome things into, into the work. So where I can, I suppose. Um, it, it, I, I guess I've gone from, say, with the Swift Tower, where it was a commission for a Swift Tower, to, to realising, actually, I can put forward a proposal that, that keep, keeps these habitats in the work and it makes a habitat for this place which wouldn't have had one otherwise. You know, it's a way of sort of, you know, again, point, suggesting something to people, encouraging people to, to do good stuff um, in their own gardens or whatever. So, you know, and coming to things like this as well, it sort of firms up, you know, things that I think, yeah, I am on the right track and I'm doing the right thing. And I'm not, I'm not an activist at all. I don't feel like one. You know, I'll go to a march maybe, but I'm more just, I'm interested in getting on with making sculpture and the form is still really key, but there's space for, you know, including things that matter. Uh, and, and, you know, like talking about the octahedron, you know, that, that's a seat for people. I can show you a picture of it quickly. Uh, yeah. So, so this is the piece at Newlands Corner, which I did with Ali and which has led to me being here, I guess. And this is really, you know, it's conceived as a piece for people. You know, it's about framing a view. It, it's a sort of, it's a seat. Um, and it, it very much, again, it's, it's a very natural form. Uh, but also it has, has these packed logs. And, and it, you know, so it's a really good refuge for, for you know, certain types of creatures. There's even a little, a, a little entrance at the bottom for hedgehogs. So I, I guess it's kind of playful, and it's playful for people, but also perhaps for, for, for nature. That's where I'm coming from. We're running out of time, so I think we've got... <laughs> well, uh, I don't have any confirmed swift nest yet. So, so I'm, we're two years into, into the one you've seen, and one year into the one up in, in Norwich. And normally it takes two or three years to get your swifts. So uh, we're, playing, we're playing the swift calls and, and we, just, we just, you know, I really want some swifts in there now. You know, it, it, you know so it's like that's part and parcel of it, yeah. So is there another one? Well, yeah, there's, there, there, <laughs> there, um, we've had observations of bats. But what we haven't done yet is uh, we need to do uh, like a little endoscope survey. And I was badgering them a couple of weeks ago because I knew this was coming up. So I was like, can we get on with the survey, please? Uh, but, but yeah, they haven't done it yet. So I, I'd love to say, yes, we've got X amount of bats and loads of baby bats, but I, I don't know for sure yet. Is that factored into your projects, the monitoring of the sculptures in the future? Or is that up to communities to monitor it, them? And... It, when, when I'm putting the ideas forward now, like this one, that I'm, I'll just show you quickly what it looks like. So this one's just open today. Maybe I can show you this, this is nice. Um, so this, this is another one that's packed with logs. And it's the sort of first one that was a commission and there was no, there was no reason for it to be a habitat other than me saying, hey, how about we do a habitat? 
And so from the very beginning, I've been encouraging the residents to kind of, first of all, once, once the work's in, to, uh, to basically to plant up wildflowers around it. And um, so they were involved with packing it and so on. But I guess what I'm saying is, yeah, they, 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 there is, so the proposal is for that, for once the wildflowers are in, which we'll get in for spring, to then monitor it that first year for pollinating insects and then keep doing that for the years to come just to see actually what, what, you know, what happens and what, what the change is. So, um, so yeah, and, and again, that's another educational thing. We can get school kids involved with it. We can get families. Uh, so so that, that's very much the idea, yeah, to, to kind of keep... I'm going to have to draw that to a close. Um, and this is yeah. exactly what I was hoping would happen, and we're having proper discussion. You're no, no, a I'm, brilliant I'm, audience. Yeah, I'm happy to chat about this further. Obviously, we've got more time later. Yeah, once we're around the buffet, um, yeah, just grab Sorry. each other to chat. So I'd like to now introduce Andrea Gregson. Thanks, Mark. It's very good. Hello. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I'm Andrea Gregson. I work with fine art at UCA Farnham. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer in fine art. I'm an artist and I also work with curation. Um, I'm doing a presentation today about two projects. The first one is some sculptural work that I've made over the last three years called Checkpoint. And the second project is um, a piece of work that I did with Gustav Metzger in 2015, Remember Nature. So the two things, um, bear with me, hopefully I'll be able to fit it all into the 20 minutes. Um, you'll find in your pack that you have this card. Okay, can you just check you have the card and you have this, remember nature. So um, maybe you want to do this after my talk, but also you could think about it whilst I'm doing my talk, but the card is um, for you to write some prompts and some questions about how you might remember nature um, how you might uh, put a pledge towards nature, given that we've got Surrey Climate Plan being launched. Is that quarter past five? Um, and what's going to happen, what I would like you to do is to pin this on the board. You'll see there's like a very tall um, panel alongside this wall. There's some pins underneath, and you can pin your kind of thoughts, your questions, to the card and onto the wall. So that's going to happen after I've done my talk. Um, Okay, so Checkpoint is a piece of work that I uh, envisaged and uh, configured when I did a residency in Denmark in Foon. And Foon is in the middle of uh, Denmark. It's one of the islands that connects Shelland and Jutland. Um, it's a space uh, which I had about six weeks, something like that, to kind of explore different types of work. Um, and I've always been really interested in the relationship between human activity, mass production, and nature, um, about the agency of objects and the form of things. And so with sculptural work and with thinking about materiality, those things connect quite deeply with nature because all of the materials that we work with are from nature or they've been mass produced through different industrial processes. Um, with the idea around nature and materiality, this is a space uh, that in Hall of God in Foon, um, and it's, it's a spiral stone um, walkway which leads up to a grove of trees. It's quite beautiful. It's a sort of laid garden uh, with some topiary. And I was given a bike, and I could go out and cycle around the, the park, the parkland. And it was a really interesting space, because in around the park was uh, various forests and quite laid out uh, formal gardens. Um, but, but you can see at the end of this vista, so I was thinking about the sort of 18th century landscape garden, the idea of the vista in creating this beautiful landscaped garden space. At the end of this particular vista was the E20, which is the major motorway that links Germany to Shelland and Foon. Um, and you can see there's been, like, in the past, there'd been some form... I think there'd been a, a storm and broken down some of the trees, and it just had this feeling of that it was quite damaged um, as a space. And I was drawn to that space at the end of the vista, what, what might be possible. And in amongst uh, this... In amongst the species was 
Um, I became quite interested in the tree scars that you could find on the glades of trees. Um, so here you can find things that are made in nature and uh, where humans have actually carved their names, something that people do. But just thinking about the two uh, connecting forms together, uh, which then led me to think about how, um, I suppose, the, the space in nature and the way that we've uh, developed our uh, kind of way of living is obviously unsustainable. Um, and us thinking about how uh, Rachel Carson's uh, Silent Spring from 1962. Um, this was an image of a poppy. This was just literally, as I was cycling, I found this sort of pile of wood. Um, and this is nature's waste. And then this is the kind of growth and it's sort of like destruction and, uh, destruction and creation in the same image. But I'm just going to read you a little bit um, from Silent Spring. Only within the moment of time represented by the present century has one species, man, acquired significant power to alter the nature of the world. The most alarming of all man's assaults upon the environment is the contamination of air, earth, rivers and sea with dangerous and even lethal particles. And it just sort of makes me think, well, that was 1962 and here we are, 2021. So it's still really potent. Um, so in a way, I suppose as an artist, you go and you journey into a space and you start to get ideas. I was really fascinated by the giant leaves. Um, but this plant here is really interesting because it's called, um, it's called chaffgrass or skogress in uh, Danish, uh, or scouring rush. And because it's quite rare, um, particularly in Denmark, they had to protect this little part of the forest uh, from the motorway, so they had to reroute the motorway around it, which I found quite interesting. Um, in the past, it's, it's been around since, um, for a very long time, it's been around since the Devonian period, so uh, you can get a sense of how a plant is very robust, and it's quite hard to get rid of once it's there, but nevertheless, it was certainly uh, a really interesting um, sort of story to think that this has been protected by this plant. Um, but the film you can see at the end of the road is the, is, um, is the road. <laughs> and so the two sounds of the, the birds and the cars together are quite compelling. That's my phone, it's a bit shaky, the film. <laughs> Uh, and then this gives you a sense of where, where we are on the map. Uh, so you can see the main E20 highway goes through. So I was interested in that space of thinking and how to find a space to make a piece of work. Um, so to think about how the E20 and the, the connection to the forest, how I could make a space for humans to think about that space. So rather than choosing a, a kind of beautiful space for a sculptural work, I chose this really difficult space because it was right on the edge of the forest. Um, so I created this object in the forest, which uh, in the studio, in the workshops of the residency space, and wanted to kind of think about like being inside that space, but also looking out into the world. So you can see there's these kind of... Um, ergonomic eye holes here so that they're based on the sort of my height but the idea is if you stand inside it um, you can look at the motorway you can choose to look at the motorway or you can choose to look at the forest and you can turn one 180 degrees so it has these two possibilities with these two viewpoints um, and I spent, it's a bit of a strange photo of me, but it was with my camera, but I spent the weekend drawing inside it, so I became this strange anomaly in the landscape um, to draw what I could see around me. So I was using some of the tree scarrings, I was using frottage, I was drawing, I was trying to draw some of the road, you can't really do that because it's too fast, um, to create a sense of stillness. Um, and the idea of being inside it, you feel like the dilemma of the road is transferred onto you as the art, in the artwork, but also there's a paradox of the place, that the sculpture has the inside space, but you can't really do anything about it, but we're all part of it. So I, I know I'm part of this, everyone here is part of this problem, but I'm trying to kind of include the viewer in, in that sort of debate through the work. Um, these drawings were just pinned up, you can see with Taylor's pins, 
and they've been, they were there for a very long time. I think maybe they're still there. <laughs> um, and it was just enough for one person, but two people were able to squeeze in <laughs> and uh, look out, look out to be seen looking in and looking out. And when you're inside, you can see the cars, you can see the trees, and the sound um, is very strong, actually. You can't be there that long, because when you stand so close to the road, it's very, very uh, unsettling. <laughs> And this is a view of the park in the winter, and I was interested in painting a, a, a swatch of some of the, the giant leaves that I showed you before. So I took that green, I went to the, um, the DIY store and I got that matched up. And what's interesting is it's something that someone was human made, it doesn't change its colour, it stays the colour that we leave it, whereas nature is always changing its colour, and I found that quite interesting, just that it stands out and it becomes like another anomaly. Um, this is a short film of me in a car trying to see the work on the motorway. And if you look quickly on the right, you'll see it. You don't blink, okay? It's coming up. There. Is it? <laughs> She's driving in the rain for that one. So, yeah, we all drive cars. We all got this uh, uh, polluting vehicles. Uh, we're trying to change all of that, of course. Um, but, yes, I think the, um, the sort of sense of this piece is that it's to kind of ask questions and to kind of make people think about a space that they're in. And those edges of nature and industry and the edges of um, in transport and transport links. Um, so that was checkpoint, checkpoint mark one. Um, I, then I proposed to make another version of this, another iteration in Rysdale Forest in Cumbria. I'm originally from Morecambe Bay, so it's, as a teenager I was always going up walking in the mountains, I was very much used to the Lake District and seeing that and enjoying the beauty of the landscape. Um, and once, once I started this residency I found, I did quite a lot of research and there's a huge industrial history in the Lake District, as is around in this area as well. And um, I went to, I worked with the rangers and they gave me some pointers to where all the, uh, the iron smelting bloomeries were in the past. And I went to look for kind of evidence and um, because they told me that you could find slag in the, in the grass. And the, the Cumbrian word for that is a moza, which is, I think it's just a sort of colloquial word. Um, but you can see that, you know, once you go into the landscape, you literally pick these things out of the ground, and they've been there. This one was from a medieval bloomery, a few hundred years old. Um, but some archaeologists, archaeologists had just recently been there to kind of excavate and look at the, the landscape. <clears throat> so the traces of uh, our industrial past are ever-present, even in a really beautiful place like the Lake District, which you associate with tourism. Um, And then this led me to a series of these frottage works, which uh, are, this is um, the Stony Hazel Finery Forge, which was a, a bloomery from uh, a few hundred years ago, which burnt down because of a commercial sort of dispute. And it, the market forces of a larger bloomery didn't want the competition, so they burnt it down. So it was always been a ruin. But when you actually go to this place, it looks like a really bucolic landscape, it's a romantic ruin, I'm thinking about the kind of romantic period, um, but actually it's a sort of scene of violence, it's a scene of um, a nature crime, because buried in amongst all of the, the moss are these, um, there's more of those pieces of slag. So what I wanted to do is, um, I called it feeling for a wall, so it was about taking graphite, which is from that area. In Borrowdale, there is a graphite mine. I could talk more about that, but I'm going to run out of time. Um, but in the Lake District, there's loads of industrial sort of uh, relics. And I was interested in that material and what it was used for. And then I sort of did some work at Stop Park Bobby Mill, uh, where I was tracing some of the kind of history of the the bobbin industry which came after the iron smelting because the coppicing changed. Uh, there was a lot of economic changes and so it wasn't, it wasn't um, profitable to make, um, do iron smelting in the Lake District and so they started to make bobbins with all the coppice wood that they had. 
Um, and this one in uh, Rusland is, is one of the only ones that it's still working. And they don't produce bobbins for industry, they produce bobbins for tourists, which is also quite interesting. Um, so, yeah, so I'll just go back a little step, sorry. Yeah, this one here, this, this piece of equipment, this piece of technology is a swiller's mare. And I did a frottage of the seating, and the swiller's mare is to, um, is to make uh, shavings of oak for swill baskets, these kind of, like, bark-peeled uh, baskets. Um, sorry, wrong direction. And then you get a sense of the... So the historic industrial machinery of the past and then using that for some drawing projects that I've been doing. And then working with a, um, a group of tourists, we had 200 participants over seven hours on a wet day outside the bog mill making a frottage of the wall. And I was interested in the wall because the wall is actually a slate wall that's been mined from the Lake District. Um, and I was informed about, you know, I know about this, that there's a huge kind of trade in children going in the mine. The mining uh, industry was very difficult at that time. So um, all of those things have had a human impact as well as a an impact on nature. So in a sense, I'm kind of working with, the, with tourists to sort of reinvigorate the idea of what labour is, you know, what is artist labour, what is labour in, in the context of tourism, what that might be. Um, these are some images of just things that I'm interested in with bracket fungus. I've got an exhibition on at the moment um, at Daniel Ar Arnaud Gallery in London, and I've made some porcelain bracket fungus, so just thought I'd throw that one in there. Um, so the, uh, the Grisdell Forest um, piece was made in my studio, and I uh, worked with different fabricators as well. And then when I installed it, I wanted to bring that colour of iron ore because iron was brought over from Barrow and Furnace over on horses and cart to the Lake District and smelted in the landscape. And also you can find in some of the streams around Grisdale Forest that the, the river has actually got this brown colour in the streams because it's still got minerals in the soil and, and minerals that are still present. Um, and inside, um, rather than like my first iteration, they were just literally drawn by hand and I was standing inside. Uh, uh, this piece, um, you can see on the film, I made it so that you could work around the objects in the forest uh, so that you can see, these are all the drawings from inside, um, which I carved into the walls of the wood. Um, these are all objects that I found from my research in that kind of specific location, but a, a lot of these things are replicated in the UK and in, in different parts of uh, the country. But when you look at these uh, objects, what I was quite fascinated was seeing how the things connect. So can you see the tally stick? I don't have a laser pen. <laughs> you see the tally stick on the bottom there? It, to me, it looks like a jawbone, a sheep jawbone or... Um, it looks an awful lot the red deer jawbone. The tally stick was used in the bobbin mill to count how many um, bobbins that were made. So you'd get like a notch on your stick. So if you made a dozen bobbins or if you made so many, you could get a notch and then you could get paid by the count. Um, and I was interested in that kind of, uh, I suppose, as a symbiotic relationship between design and objects and objects out in nature. So you can see things across even like the, uh, the hand grenade from World War II, because in Grisdale Forest it was a prisoner of war camp uh, for a period of time. Um, I don't know if you've seen that film, The One That Got Away, from the 1960s. Does anyone know that? But it was actually filmed in Grisdale Forest um, about a, a German prisoner of war uh, who managed to escape and got back, got back home. Um, but it's very close to the design of a pine cone, so... Um, there, you know, there is this kind of where one might be really destructive, the other one is about being uh, is uh, about creation and growth. Um, even back to this sort of Silurian fossil, <clears throat> and then looking at more kind of modern forms. Um, can you see? Let me see that drawing. Um, the bark peelers hut. 
if you can see that there, and the charcoal burning hut. So I was thinking of Darrow with your charcoal burning. So they, they did an awful lot of charcoal burning in the Lake District. <clears throat> and so the piece is still there, and uh, people are welcome to kind of go inside, and it's on a very sort of popular part of the path, so a lot of children are using it, a lot of adults. You can lift people up inside, um, children. Um, and these are some of the kind of spaces in which... Uh, you can see more of the work. Okay, so um, I'd like to talk about uh, the work that I did with um, Gustav Metzger in 2015. Uh, myself and Joe Jolson from London Fieldworks, um, we worked together with Gustav to develop this project, Remember Nature. Um, and we're currently, we're reactivating that for 2022. So that will be November the 4th, 2022. So um, what we'd like you to do is, if you've got this now, um, on here you can see there is, <coughs> there's a WordPress uh, website. Um, and also you can take part in that um, by just, just sending an email, <laughs> um, registering your details. So... It was instigated with Gustav Metzger. We were talking one day about how to develop work after facing extinction project, which we did at Farnham campus. With, in fact, some other people are here who were involved in that. <laughs> uh, in 2014, we had a facing extinction conference and uh, exhibition. And a lot of the people on campus, the students, the fine arts students were really involved in that. Um, so it led from there and there was this kind of... Um, interest in try how to kind of push this further and how to develop it. So we worked together with hans Ulrich Oberist and the Serpentine Gallery to create this uh, 4th of November 2015. And the idea was to get everybody together in who are working in the art world, art schools, art universities, art and design, uh, to um, make a work in response to Remember Nature. And, to, and then we uploaded it onto a website. Um, the event, launch event took place at Central St. Martin's College in the, um, in the main sort of concourse area. And we had various responses from people in artists and galleries and art schools and universities over the world, globally. Um, so one of the things about Gustav's project um, is that even though now it would, he, you know, he's very keen to kind of keep this going. So uh, um, after he passed away... Um, we started talking about it last year, sort of thinking about how we could reactivate it. Um, and this was one of the kind of questions that started it. What can art do? And I think today at the conference you can see how many different types of um, approaches that artists have to kind of make difference and make changes in the world. Um, and you can see Gustav's quote there the art, architecture and design world needs to take a stand against the ongoing erasure of species. I've got a sound, um, a film of him at the end, so we can play that. So I'm not going to read it out now. Um, so what we did then was a, that we sent out a letter, but we'll also be doing this now. What we want to do is to mobilise as many... Uh, art universities and galleries and in the art world to kind of make a kind of stand for this um, about making collective artworks, working together and then working with the, um, the newspapers that we find that we assemble together and present them as a sculptural block, creating media walls um, and printed media and then documenting actions and then sending them to the WordPress site. So this is an example of um, the launch, and th some of these things were happening in different art schools. There's Gustav uh, at Central St. Martins on the 4th of November 2015. And um, it was quite intense because it was full on all day, and so we, we had a, a version of this when we made um, Facing Extinction Conference at Farnham Campus. We had a lot of students working on that. And, um, and they, they, that looked totally different because that was more the way that Gustav would have kind of chosen it in a very sort of square block, in a rectangular block, really quite sort of uh, focused. But with this particular project, it kind of took on its own. It sort of took on its own life. And uh, the students sort of really pushed the, the images out into a big space. Um, this, 
I have a few copies uh, around, um, but this was the uh, copy of the, the, the brochure that was made by Agnes B, which was made globally um, and distributed to different art schools. And, and anyone who was participating, anyone who registered could get these and they could use them to, um, to kind of, you know, communicate the whole project, but also it's bigger than just the project, it's, it's actually about nature, so, um, and back in 2015, it, it was pressing then, it's also, it's even more pressing now. Um, so the, the actual uh, flyer was made by Gr Bruce Gil Grillkirst and Joe Jolson with Gustav, so they kind of designed that together, and then it was distributed. Um, so if you'd like, I don't want to read that out, but if you read that to yourselves, because I do have a clip of Gustav, and it's, I always say to my students, don't read something that's on the screen. <laughs> it doesn't work. So, yeah, just read that, and read that quietly to yourselves, and I think it's a really powerful statement. One minute, okay. So this is very quickly uh, some of the things that was done. I'm just going to flip through these. This was at Middlesex University. We did a show at Farnham Campus and also I did one at University of East London. Um, this is the thing that you've got in your delegate pack. And now I just want to, I don't think it will work unless I go back. I have to just activate this one second. So we're going to end with Gustav. Um, his film. I, I Gustav, Gustav Metzger, am asking, I'm asking for your, your participation, participation in this worldwide call for the day, day of action to, to remember, remember nature on November, on November 4th, 2015. We appeal to arts professionals from all disciplines to take a stand against the ongoing erasure of species. It is our privilege and our duty to be at the forefront of the struggle. There is no choice but to follow the path of ethics into aesthetics. We live in societies suffocating in waste. Our task is to remind people of the richness and complexity in nature, to protect nature as far as we can. And by doing so, our art will enter territories that are inherently creative. We invite you to respond creatively to this call and encourage, and encourage others to, to participate, participate also. The aim, the aim is to create, to create a mass, mass movement across, across the, arts the arts to ward, to ward off, off extinction. extinction. Thank, you. Thank you. So um, that was quite powerful to see that. Um, that was from 2015. So we are going to re, um, reinvigorate this. We're going to sort of rework it for next year. So 4th of November 2022. So what I encourage you to do now uh, is to think about what you would like to say. We have uh, the Surrey Climate Plan being launched today. So if you could write that on your card, how will you remember nature? What might you 
be able to do, what question might you have? And then I invite you to kind of pin your responses on the card to the table around the side with the cork board. Um, there's pins underneath, so you can just go and get your own pin, so you're not going to cross-contaminate or anything. Um, but I really appreciate your response. Don't worry about writing something you don't feel is quite right. Just respond, you know, directly. I think that's really important. So we get lots of, lots of feedback. Um, and, uh, and you can do this alongside the block printing and also uh, we've got the, uh, the food as well. But if anyone wants to talk to me, I know we've run out of time now, Ali, haven't we? Um, I will be standing with the cards. Please come and ask me some questions. Um, and, you know, I don't know if anyone wants to ask now directly. Questions over the buffet, that would be great. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. Thank you so much. Um, and what a brilliant way to end those words by uh, Gustav Metzger.